Okay, today's daf we're going to learn is Eruvin daf Nun Bet. We're going to finish the fourth parak today. Um, okay, we ended yesterday with this complicated machloka between Rav Nachman and Rav Chista, which was how they understood the machloket of Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda. Remember, whether they understood that Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda disagreed about machloket um, bimkomi, if I say I want my shvita, remember Rabbi Yehuda says, Echad ani echad ashir. Whether you're on the way or whether you're not on the way, you get to do an eruv from a, right. You get to do an eruv biraglav. The question is, when we say biraglav, do we mean actually with your raglav shvitati bimkomi? Whereas Rabbi Meir says you can't do shvitati bimkomi if you're poor, if you're rich and you're basically from your own house. You're not allowed to do that. You have to send bread. Or is there machloket in the case of when you want to say I want? my shvita to be, I want my residence to be in a far off place where you kind of point from a distance or not even point. You just say, and is that the debate between them where Rabbi Yehuda says, oh, you can even do that even if you're in your house. Whereas Rabbi Meir says, no, you can't. Okay, so the main way we went by was Rav Nachman who said, no, both of them agree that you can't do it from a distance unless you're a Baba Derech. You're someone who's coming from far away and you're trying to get home or you're on your way somewhere rather than if you're coming from your own house and you have the option to put bread down then you can't okay so again we talked about three types of eruv today we're going to even mention a fourth okay one is you put bread down one is you use your feet and you stand there and the third is you kind of say from a distance shvitati b'makomploni which was a new thing that we said wow that's interesting that we even allow this and then the question is How limited is it? Is it only if you're a person on the way and we allow it only in special matters? Or even according to to Rav Chisti, even Rabbi Yehuda would allow it for someone from their own house. Okay, but we didn't really go with that approach and that's going to introduce us to this first story. I'm going to start at the very bottom of Nun Aleph Amabet, the second, the last line at the bottom. Rabba Barav Natan, Hava Ragel Da'ate Me'ar Tivna Lepubedita. He would regularly go from his hometown of Artivna to Pumbedita. Okay, why was he going there regularly? Probably there was a Shi'or there and he wanted to go learn there. So he would normally go there, okay? And he would stay at home. And what would he do? Amar shvitati b'tsinata. He would say, he would be in his house and he would say, well, I want my shvita to be in Sinata. He didn't put out food. He didn't go there, but he would say it. Okay, so this is exactly what we just said, which seemed now, in this case, is he an Ani or an Ashir? He's an Ashir because he's coming from his house. So it seems like the only way you could say this would be to hold by Rav Chista and to hold by Rabbi Yehuda. Remember, Rav Chista says the machloket is if you say, my shvita, right, I want it to be in a particular place. And Rabbi, then Rabbi, if that's the machloket, then you'd have to hold like Rabbi Yehuda, the achadani achad Ashir. So that's what Abayah is going to say to him. Amalei Abayah, my datech. Why are you holding this way? Why do you think it's okay to do what you're doing? Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Lachaka, Rabbi Yehuda. I assume you're holding in the Machlok of Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda. We hold like Rabbi Yehuda. We already saw that was one of our rules. Ve, but now the Amar Rav Chista Machlok of Makomploni. But you'd have to hold like Rav Chista that their whole debate is when you say I want to acquire residence in a far off place. Vaha Rav Nachman v'Tanya Kavate. But how can you ignore Rav Nachman's approach and not only? Because Rav Nachman disagrees with Rav Chista, but also we brought a Braita to strengthen Rav Nachman's position. So we don't really hold that way, the way you're holding. So what's Rabbi Bar Rav Hanan's response? Amalei, Hadre B. Okay, I'm going to stop doing this. Basically, he agrees with Abaye that he made a mistake and he changes his way. Now we're going to get into something else entirely, and we'll see in a minute why this connects to our Mishnah, because they're going to try to bring an answer. They're going to, Rami Barham is going to ask a question, and they're going to bring an answer from the last line of our Mishnah. Ama Rami Barhama, Amru Shavvat Yesh Lo Dalet Amot. We already learned that if you get stuck somewhere, right, you end up, or, or if you acquire residence by standing in a place, remember, we keep talking about these two kinds of Eruvs. You have the Eruv where either you put bread down, again, talking about the main two, Either you put bread or you yourself stand there. So now they're going to ask a question about the difference between the two. If I stand there when Shabbat starts, or if I was walking somewhere and I was on my way and I basically got stuck for Shabbat, and where I'm standing is where I acquire residence, how much do I have, if you remember? I get 2,000 ama, but I also get the four cubits around me because my personal space 
is my four cubits, right? We keep talking about how this is like nowadays with our social distancing, right? We have about two meters around us, right? That's about four cubits. So we have four cubits of space around us. That's our personal space. So now, now how did I just define that? Personal space. So I understand if Shavat Yesh Lo Dalet Amot. If I'm physically there, then I get four Amot plus another 2,000. But what if Hanotenet Eruvo? If I put bread down, Yesh Lo Dalet Amot or Lo? It's an interesting question because it's saying, how does this bread function? Is the bread functioning as representative of me? And if I get four Amot, then my bread gets four Amot. Or is the bread just a symbol that I want to acquire residence in this place and I put my food down, but bread doesn't have personal space. So basically we're going to say wherever my bread is, that's where you count 2,000 amma from there. You don't get four cubits. So that's his question. It's a good question. So now the Gemara says, let's try to learn it from our Mishnah. Amma Rava. Rava actually says it. Tashma. What does it say in our Mishnah? Lo amru ma'arvim bepat. What does it say? The whole idea of pat is just a leniency to make it easier for people. Now, if it's a leniency, so let's go all the way. If you're saying the whole thing of bread is just to make your life easier, but now you're going to tell me that if I put my bread down, I only get 2,000 and I don't get those extra four, it's actually going to be a chumra. It's going to be stringent because the laws of the bread are now going to be more stringent than if I actually went there myself. And the Mishnah seems to imply that bread is just a leniency. It's to make my life easier. And now it's going to make it limiting more because it's going to limit me more because it's only going to allow me 2,000 and not 2,004. I don't know if you're thinking about this, but the Gemara is going to basically say, no, that's not, you didn't read the, the Mishnah right. When it says it's to make your life easier, it doesn't necessarily mean, and it's going to be just the, the same. The law is going to be the same. It's basically saying, it's making my life easier that I don't have to bother myself to go out there and actually put it down. That's what it means. Nitrach v'nefuk, right? Nitrach is to, to burden myself and nefuk to go out physically. It's to make it easier that I could just put bread down and or send someone to put my bread down and I don't actually have to go there or I can go there, but I don't have to be there when Shabbat starts. So now that you could still say, but it limits you to 2,000. And the kula is just about letting me sit in my house and let my work be done for me. But the kula is not how much space I get. And anyway, the difference between 2,004 and 2,000 is not so huge. So therefore, we really can't prove anything from this line. And therefore, we end up really without an answer to this question. Okay? Mishnah. Okay. This is a very complicated Mishnah. I'll already, it's not so complicated, but what it means is a big source of debate. The Rambam explains it more like the Yerushalmi, okay, which is not the way Rashi explains it. Rashi actually gives two different explanations. I'm going to, again, when things are so complicated because it's stuff Yomi, I try to simplify. On the other hand, I want to show you that there's other opinions and other ways to read this. So I'm going to kind of go with one opinion, but I'm going to mention the other um, minorly without going into all the details, just so that you get a sense of the different approaches here. Misha, and we saw this already yesterday. Or maybe okay, if someone's going out to a city that generally people make an Eruv between the two cities, right? It's classic cities that we know there are 2, 000, more than 2,000 Amot away. People like to go from one to the other and they generally make an Eruv. Or maybe this person makes an Eruv generally. He goes to make his Eruv and what happens? Or she goes to make her Eruv. But a friend came and said, hey, come back. Before... You got to make the Eruv. So let's say it was you. You tried going to make your Eruv. You're now allowed to go to the nearby town even though you didn't actually make an Eruv. Okay, we're going to talk about why. This is why I said we're going to see even four options possibly about how you could do an Eruv. But, um, sorry, I lost my place. The but everyone else in the city is not allowed to go to the neighboring city. Divrei Rabbi Yehuda. Okay, now, there's, what's strange about this Mishnah that causes all sorts of problems? Who said anything about the Bnei Ha'ir? Why were the Bnei Ha'ir even a factor here? Nobody said there was an Eruv for the Bnei Ha'ir. It was, I was going, let's just assume it was me. I was going personally to put an Eruv down. Why are we saying, I can go to the nearby town, but nobody else can? I wasn't. So, the Yerushalmi, and based on that, the Rambam say, 
that we're missing some details here. And obviously what they're talking about is that I was sent as a messenger to put an Eruv down for everyone. Okay? But I didn't put the Eruv down. This isn't the explanation I'm going to go by, but I want you to know that the Rambam basically explains this based on the Yerushalmi. And the Yerushalmi even gives two different explanations within this. But that I am a messenger to go put the Eruv down for everybody. For the whole town. Okay, here you see someone can put an error for other people. We already saw two people were on the way and one person knew the tree and the other one didn't. He could say, I'm doing this for both of us. So I could theoretically put an error down for everyone. And what it's saying is, if I don't actually physically get there, we still allow me, and now you have to fill in the blanks, allow me to get, how did I get the a roof, right? We talked about bread. I didn't put bread down. We talked about standing there. I didn't stand there because I went back home. So it's one of two possibilities. Either we're referring back to the case where I just say the words, Shvitati b'makom ploni, and then we allow me to do this. And why do we allow me to do it? Based on Rabbi Yehuda, that achad ani achad ashir, it doesn't matter if I'm coming from my house or not. Or maybe even Rabbi Yehuda thinks I have to be baderech, but maybe I'm already considered, right? This whole debate here. Because I am Baderech, but I'm not exactly Baderech. It's not the way we described in the previous mission where I was trying to get home. Here I'm in my city, which means I'm not exactly in Ani because I have food in my house and I could have brought food. So I'm kind of in between. I did start walking, so I'm kind of on the way, but I'm also in my hometown. It's a bit of a tricky thing, and that's why it's unclear. So now there's two possibilities. What, okay, so again, we have question of, was I trying to do this for everybody or not? That's a good question. Not so clear. According to Rashi, I wasn't a shaliach. I was just doing it for myself. And what it's trying to say is, I'm different from everybody else. And then the Gemara is going to have to explain why. That's going to be the first question of the Gemara. And the Gemara is going to give an explanation. But like I said, the Yerushalmi, this is the Bavli's explanation. The Yerushalmi has a different. But then the question is, did I say something? Or maybe, according to some commentaries, I didn't even say anything. I didn't even say Shvi Tatiba Makomploni. But it works because I started walking, which meant I started indicating. And since, notice how it started out. It's an Ir Shema Arvin Lat, it's an, a city that generally I make an Arab to go to. So everyone kind of knew where I was going with this and where I wanted to put my Arab down. So even if I didn't put my Arab down, even if I didn't stand there, even if I didn't say, some people think, it's enough and it's as if I put my Arab down. Just that I started walking, that's enough. So potentially, again, it depends how you understand this. Not everyone understands this way. Potentially, there's a fourth way, which is I just started walking. I didn't even say anything. And here you see, this is all over the Gemara where we talk about are my int- the fact that I think something and intend something. Is that enough even without saying anything? Okay, my machshava can have significance even without saying anything. So the fact that I started walking and got detained Maybe that's enough to say it works for me, okay? But not for Anshe Iri, okay? So again, we'll get to the Gemara, why they say not for Anshe Iri. According to the Yerushalmi, because I'm not going to go back to the Yerushalmi and the Rambam, but I want to explain before we move on. According to the Yerushalmi and the Rambam, why does it work for me and not for anybody else? Because if I want to put down, this is a very weak kind of Eruv, right? Because I didn't even put anything down at all. And maybe I didn't even say, maybe I did but I didn't put anything down. I'm certainly not there by myself. It's basically coming to say that's not enough to work for other people, but it's enough to work for yourself. Okay. That could work for yourself, not for other people. Okay. Um, There, there have, again, I don't want to get into everything. There's some interpretation of the Yerushalmi, the Adaf that doesn't work for the person it works for other. I'm not going to get into that, but there's all sorts of interpretations here. It's a very complicated Mishnah. Um, There were, because for, for them to understand what it was referring to. Okay, so again, let's just go with the way the Bavli is going to explain it, not the Yerushalmi now. So it's basically, it's not that I'm a messenger for someone. I'm just going to put my own Eruv. So I go out, I get detained. I never make it there. I can still go to the neighboring town. And again, two options, either because I said Shvitati Makabloni or maybe I didn't even say it and indicating I wanted to was enough. So I can go to the neighboring town on Shabbat, but the people in my city can't. Divrei Rabbi Yehuda, like I said, we're going to get the Gemara to the explanation as to why. Rabbi Meir Omer, Koshu Yachola Arev, Lo Irev, since he tried to but didn't succeed, well, Harezeh Chamar Gamal. Now you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. What does that mean here? Well, you wanted to say, I don't want my Erev to be my house, I want it to be there. But according to Rabbi Meir, this doesn't work. 
for sure, because Rabbi Meir says only in Ani, and you're clearly not in Ani here because you're coming from your house. So Rabbi Meir says it doesn't work in the new place. On the other hand, you got rid of your Eruv in the old place, and what he basically says is, you're stuck in between your house and the Eruv. And you basically have to go for the Chumrat of both places. Okay, even though he doesn't think it was effective, your Eruv, he basically says, but you, it was enough to show that you're not going to get either. So basically now you're stuck between only the places where, where you wanted to do an Eruv and where you are living over overlap. Okay, I forgot, by the way, to put up the sheet of today's daf. Um, so if someone wants to put it up in the chat, there's a sheet today. I'm sorry I didn't mention it in the beginning, but you can put it up in the chat. It'll be helpful, certainly, as we go on in the, in the Gemara. Okay, so continuing on. Now the Gemara is going to ask the question that we wanted to know, which we actually learned already yesterday. Um, so now, uh, before I move on, I see there's a question. So let me just address it. The question came up, which is, when he decides to return, doesn't that mean that he rescinds his kavanah to the other place? And no, that's the whole idea here. And that's what we're going to read right now. It's clear that he didn't rescind his kavanah. He still wants to get to the neighboring town. Why did he come back? And that's why we'll see how they're going to explain this. So hold off on your question. We're going to get to it in a minute. Um, there's a study guide. Is there not? Is it not on the... Sh- oh, you know what? Maybe I didn't put it up. Okay, here's the study guide. I put it up now. Um, okay. So now... The Gemara says, what's the difference between him and everybody else? Maishna iu, maishna inhu. Okay, what's the difference? So they're now going to say, Amar Rav Huna, hacha b'mayaskinan, kegon sheyesh lo shnei batim, u'benehem shnei tchume shabbat. Okay, what's the case here? He has two houses, and this is why, according to your question, Becky, as to why it doesn't show he rescinds his kavanah, because he has a house in the other town. Okay, he wants to get to the other town because he has a house there. So now what happened? He has two houses, but there's too much space in between. He can't get to them through Tchum Shabbat. So, He, because he already started going, he showed he wanted to get there, even though he came back. And we're going to see later, it's explained that maybe the reason he came back is because his friend said to him, listen, it's too hot right now, or it's too cold right now, and you shouldn't go out right now, right? We can... You're living in Israel right now. In most places, it's super hot. And you can see why someone might say, this isn't a good time to be walking out right now. Okay, so since he started going on the way, he's already considered in Ani. Uh, now we get into our terminology. That if, Rabbi Yehuda, if you remember, said, if he's in Ani, right, achad Ani, achad Ashir, but if you want to say, shvitati b'makom ploni, you have to be Ani even according to Rabbi Yehuda. That's Rav Nachman's reading. So now... Since he already started going on the way, he's like an Ani. But Hane Ashirin Inu, but everyone else in the town, now here it comes again. According to the Yerushalmi, it's because he was a representative of them, but this kind of Erev doesn't work for him to do as a representative. Only works for him. But according to the Bavli, no, it just means that if they were to want to do the same thing, they couldn't because they didn't start going on the way. Rabbi Yehuda says, if you start going on the way, you're automatically in Ani, even though you're still in your own town. And therefore, once you're in Ani, you can say, Shvitati Okay? And that's why this works. Or potentially even to go even farther to say, maybe even without saying any words, it works. And maybe that's because he's got a house, which indicates it's a very, it's obvious that that was the person's intent. So even though the person went back home, it's not because what you thought, Becky, that he's showing I don't want to go. No, he just went home for some random reason because his friend pulled him back. But not that he doesn't really want to go there. He clearly does want to go there. And that's why it works. But it only will work for that person, not for anybody else because they haven't left their houses and didn't show any indication that they were trying to get there. Okay, so that's the way the Bavli understands it. Like I said, different people understand this Mishnah in other ways. Tanya Nami Hachi, we're going to have a bright to support this. And here you're going to see more details. Here this explains exactly Rabbi Yehuda, right? That. Here you have it. This is exactly the way we just explained Rabbi Yehuda. You have two houses. There's two Tchumei Shabbat. There's 4,000 Amot in between. Since you already started going on the way, you acquired your Eruv. Okay? And that's a proof to this reading of the Mishnah. Yeter al came, But now the Brayta continues. And now we're going to have to figure out what's the Machloket Rabbi Yosi Rabbi Yehuda with Rabbi Yehuda. 
yeter al kein, which means he added even more so, meaning we're going to allow even more than Rabbi Yehuda allowed. Amar Rabbi Yossi Rabbi Yehuda, afilu mitzao chavero, and here you're going to see the friend. Even if the friend finds him, and Amarlo lean po and said, "Sleep here tonight. Don't keep walking. Sleep here. Eight chamahu, eight sinahu. It's too hot outside, or it's too cold outside." Lemachar mashkim vaholech. I'm still allowed to go out to the nearby town, even if my friend detained me. So now the big debate becomes: What did Rabbi Yosi, Rabbi Yehuda, add to what Rabbi Yehuda already said? Okay, where is he more lenient? So we're going to have a machloket, and for you, there's a chart on the page. Rabba and Rav Yosef. Amar Rabba, lomar kule amalu pligi ditzarich. To say, I'm acquired, in other words, everyone agrees, and this goes back to what we discussed before that wasn't so clear, according to Rabba, everyone agrees that when you get detained by your friend, okay, or, or whatever reason, right, Rabbi Yehuda doesn't even give a reason, you started walking and you went back home without actually reaching the spot. Everyone agrees that you have to say the words, shvitati b'makom ploni. Okay, I want my place of residence to be that spot that I usually use, or whatever it might be. But what's the machloka between them? Now, notice the words. Rabbi Yehuda said, "Kevan shechzik baderach," and Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda didn't use those words. So comes Rabbi and he says, "Kipligi lachzik." The machloka becomes: Do you have to actually start walking or not? According to Rabbi Yehuda, it says, "Kevan shechzik baderach." Okay, because you already started walking. That's why you acquired your Eruv. But Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda says, even if your friend finds you and says, sleep here, he claims, okay, this is Rabbi's reading, that Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda was talking about a case where you didn't even start walking yet. You were thinking about going. And your friend says to you, don't go, it's too hot. And you say, okay, fine, I won't go. Even if you didn't leave your house, the fact that you originally had intent that's sufficient, as long as what? Remember, Kuleamalu Pligi, that you have to say something. You have to actually say the words, I'm Konesh Vita in that random place. Okay, that's enough. Okay, and that's a radical opinion because that basically means that you don't need to actually start walking. Just thinking it in your mind is sufficient. Okay, as long as, again, well, it's tricky. Thinking in your mind that you want to go there is enough to consider you a Baba Derech. And then once you're a Baba Derech, even though you're actually physically sitting in your own house, even though you're a, a Baba Derech, you're someone who's on the way, you're considered on the way because you thought to go on the way, we already classify you as a Nani, a poor person, and a poor person is allowed to make their Erev by saying, I want to acquire my Erev in a far off place. So that's Rabbi's explanation. Rav Yosef Amar, Lachzit no way. That's not going to work. Everybody agrees. Even Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda says, you have to start walking. If you don't start walking, of course we don't allow you to get your Erev in this way. You have to somehow be someone on the way. Otherwise, there's no way we'd allow you to do this. What's the machloket? Kipligi lomar. The question is, you have to say it in words. Is it enough that you started walking and you have your house in the other town by the way, there's a debate among the Rishonim whether it has to be that you have a house in another town or maybe not necessarily, and that was just an example, okay? But is it enough that you started walking and that's enough that even if you turn around and go back and you never say the words, Shvita Tiba Makomploni, Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yehuda says that's still good. Rabbi Yehuda will say, no, you have to say the words, okay? And it's both required you to leave your house and start walking, but the debate is you actually have to say the words Shvita Tiba Makomploni or not. So now we're going to say, Keman az lahadam Ula. Ula made the following statement, according to who does this go? Mi shechzik baderech. So first we're going to see Ula, then we're going to see what Ula's statement means, and then we're going to see who it goes like. Mi shechzik baderech, someone who started walking. Vichziro chavero, that's the case we've been discussing. Hareze muchzar u muchzak. The person is returned to his original place, and muchzak, meaning he's muchzak baderech, as if he started walking. So the Gemara first questions this and says, wait a minute, that's, that's an oxymoron. You can't be muhzar in your original place and also be considered that you're on your way. So i muhzar lama muhzak. If he's considered that he went back home, then he's considered like he's in his house. And he's not considered someone who's on the way. Lama, so lama muhzak, why would you say he's muhzak that he went on the way? And i muhzak, if he's considered like someone who's on his way, lama muhzar, why is he considered as if he went back home? 
So they first explain what Ula said, which is hachikamer. This is what he meant to say. Even though he's back home physically, he's considered that he was already established that he was walking on the way, and therefore we call him in Ani for these purposes, like he's someone on the way. And then, what do we mean? So then it's 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 not clear what he means. So Kiman, Kirav Yosef, Aliba de Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yehuda. So they say it must mean that he's referring to Rav Yosef. That's what was Rav Yosef's explanation, that everyone needs you to be muhzak, right? In other words, and that's why we're calling him a muhzak. But notice what was missing here. He didn't ever say anything. So therefore, it must be, Rav Yosef says, that's the homachlok, and Rav Yosef, Rav Yehuda's mekel, he's lenient, that you don't need to actually say the words that I'm walking to, you know, I want my residence to be in that place. And yet it works. So that's what he's saying. It must be Rabbi Yosef according to Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yehuda. And now we're going to have another case. Rabbi Yehuda bar Ishtita, he brought fruits, a basket of fruits to Rav Nata bar Oshaya. Now, Kiava Azil, he wanted to go home, but his house was outside the Tchum. So here he wants to go out. He's on his way back before Shabbat, and he wants to basically go home. So he starts walking out. Now, once he walks out, it's obvious that what? He obviously is intending to be Konesh Vita somewhere on the way so we can get to his house because his house is outside the Tchum. Must be, you know, right before Shabbat starts. So, Rav Natan Bar Hoshaya waits. Waits how long? He waits. He lets him start, start, he lets him to start walking. And, Azil Shavke Ad Darga. Now, the question here becomes, how far on the way do you have to be? So he waits until he goes down the stairs. Okay, they were obviously like in the higher up space. He starts walking down the stairs, and then he says, Stay overnight. I don't want you to get stuck in the wall, on the path at nighttime. Stay, sleep here. Bitachi is like, make your house here. And tomorrow, get up and walk. So what do you see here? You see, number one, the first thing is you see that how much time do you need to... How much do you need to be in order to be muhzak baderech? Just a little bit, right? As long as you just go down the stairs, you indicate already you're on your way. Kiman, and who does this go according to? Kirav Yosef va'aliba de Rabbi Yosef Rabbi Yehuda. Now they're questioning and they say, wait a minute. According to who are you going? Kirav Yosef va'aliba de Rabbi Yosef Rabbi Yehuda? Are you, now notice, the person didn't say, I want to acquire shvita in that place. So because he didn't say that, and all he did, I see also, it actually means he descended even only one step. Because he descended one step, he's already muhzak baderech, but he didn't say anything, and yet it works. So that seems to go like Rav Yosef's interpretation, I'll leave it to Rav Yosef, Rav Yehuda, which is what we just explained a minute ago, that you don't need to actually say anything. All you need to do is start being on your way, and you already acquire, because it's obvious where you're going. But the Gemara doesn't like that we're holding that way. He's saying, is that who you hold like? That's like a super lenient opinion. So they say, no, no, you could say otherwise. You could say, that maybe he holds like Rabbah's reading and according to Rabbi Yehuda. So look back at the chart if you want, it'll help you. So what does Rabbah say? Everyone agrees that you need to say something. The debate is, do you have to be on your way? And then he holds like Rabbi Yehuda that you have to be on your way. And that's why he made him go down one step. But that was enough to be considered on the way. But he definitely had to say it. And the story just didn't tell us that detail. But obviously you had to say it because it's obvious. Everyone thinks you need to say it. And there is no fourth category of, oh, you just need to intuit it or, or indicate you want to do it. No, that doesn't exist. Okay. And therefore, they say maybe it's that opinion and not this opinion of Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef, Rav Yehuda, that you actually don't even need to say anything. You could just intend to go somewhere and that's enough. It's fascinating to think that just your intent alone would be enough to say basically, you know, you can get there. Um, but again, they take other factors into consideration. You know, maybe you had two houses and it's clear and you always go this way and that therefore your intent is enough to kind of combine with that to say it's, it's sufficient. And again, you also need to start walking, right? You need to start going in that direction, but you don't even need to say anything. It's enough to get you there. Okay. So, right. It's also how other people understand this. 
Um, right. How the Yerushalmi deals with the whole sugya, right? That's a separate. The Yerushalmi obviously doesn't have that story, or you know, in other words, then that's why I didn't want to. It's too complicated to start reading the Yerushalmi into the whole sugya. Again, the Yerushalmi doesn't have to fit in with the sugyas of the Bavli either. The Yerushalmi just has to fit in with the Mishnah because they can have other interpretations of the Mishnah. Okay, Rabbi Meir Homer. So now we're getting to Rabbi Meir who says, You're stuck in between the two spots. So the Gemara says, wait a minute. We already know Rabbi Meir's approach, this Hamar Gamal approach to Safek Eruv. How do we know this? Safek Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda Omrim, Hamar Gamal. Okay, this goes back to a mission we saw on Lamed Hay. What happened there? Remember, it, you had you put it down and then it burned, or the truma gatame, and we just don't know when was it there ben Ashmashot, or was it already destroyed ben Ashmashot? So we said if it's a fake and you don't know, so Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Huda both say hareza chamar gama. You're basically stuck in between your two eruvs. So isn't that the same as this case right here? We're going to see it's not exactly the same. Here it's not exactly a doubt. Here it's just you intended one eruv but you stopped your intention and then you went back home and we basically say you're in between both. So that's what the Gemara is going to say. This isn't exactly the same. So Amar Rav Sheshet, Rav Sheshet explains, Lo tema tama de Rabbi Meir, safek irev, safek lo irev, hu da have chamar gamal, avavadai lo irev, lo have chamar gamal. You might have thought to say that the reason for Rabbi Meir there and the safek erev, if we only had the safek erev and we didn't have our case, what would you say? There, there was an erev. It's just a matter of was your Eruv still in existence when Shabbat started or not? We don't know. Then we would say, then you're a Hamar Gamal. But in this case, Vadai Lo Erev. Rabbi Meir clearly thinks you didn't do an Erev here. So if you didn't do an Erev, maybe you're not a Hamar Gamal, right? One might have thought, you might, if I had asked you before we learned the Mishnah, you might have thought Rabbi Meir says, you didn't do anything. And since you didn't do anything, you're basically you're at your house. And you get 2,000 Amar in all directions. But no, even Rabbi Meir sees your intention here as something, as enough to basically say you're uprooting your original Eruv, even though you didn't succeed in creating your new one, and we're going to view you as a Hamar Gamal here, pulled in both directions, and therefore, El Afilu Vadai Lo Erev, even if for sure you didn't make an Eruv, because Rabbi Meir clearly doesn't think this works to make an Eruv in this way, Have Hamar Gamal, and that's what we learn from here, Dahahacha, because our case is Vadai Lo Erev, Vakahave Hamar Gamal, okay, and yet you're pulled in both directions, according to Rabbi Meir. So this mission teaches you that even if, in a case where you clearly didn't make an Eruv, but you did indicate that you don't necessarily, that you that you wanted your Eruv to be somewhere else, that's enough to basically put you in this bad predicament where you can't go anywhere other than where both spots overlap. New Mishnah. Mi chutz Afilu ama lo yikanes. Ama achat lo yikanes. We already made reference to this mission earlier. If you go outside the boundaries of your tchum, one ama already, you can't go back into the tchum. Rabbi Leezer says it depends. If it was two, you're still allowed back in. One or two, right? Up to two, you're still allowed. We learned this already because it's called havla'at tchumim. Because you have two amot in every direction and the two overlap. So you're basically allowed, right? If you, you're allowed to remember where Lezer says you have two in each direction. He doesn't give you four in one direction. He gives you two in every direction, which gives you four altogether. And therefore, when you walk the two, you're actually on the border of the tchum, and therefore you're allowed to go back inside. But three already, lo yikanes. You can't go back in. And he, presumably he means anything more than two. Now we're going to have two versions of what Rabbi Hanina says. Amma Rabbi Hanina in the Gemara. What if you have one foot in and one foot out? Okay, it sounds like the hokey pokey, right? One foot in, one foot out. Okay, or it sounds a lot like the sugyo we talk about is relevant to now, Chag Sukkot, right? Where we have what if, right? Let's say you have a very small sukkah if your head and the majority of your body is in. Now, if you put your foot out, the majority of your body is still in because usually your foot goes first. So if one foot is out but the majority of your body is in, what are you considered? So Rabbi Hanina says, Lo yikanes, you can't go back in. Dichtiv, and here also, this was from the Haftorah on Yom Kippur, if you paid attention. This was something, a verse that we learned a lot in Masechet Shabbat. Im tashiv mi Shabbat raglecha. What do we learn from this? That the way you walk, right? If you walk outside the tchum. Now, the word is written, raglecha, but the Masoret, we, the tradition we have is that it's raglecha. What's the difference between raglecha and raglecha? Raglecha is single. Raglecha, usually we have a yud, or possibly would have a yud. It's not written with a yud. But raglecha means plural, your, your feet. So, it says, in Toshima Shabbat raglecha, 
we read it as raglecha. If you look in a Tanakh, you'll see it like that. It's a pasuk from Yeshayahu. Raglecha ktiv, but it's written without a yud, so you could read it as your foot, which means as soon as you take your foot out, you're already outside the tchum. So now they say, wait a minute, Hatanya, but there's a brighter that says, Raglocha betocha tchum, Raglocha chutz the tchum, you canes. There's a different brighter that says, if one foot's in, one foot's out, you're allowed to go back in, because the majority of your body's inside. So they say, oh, that's not a question, Rabbi Hanina, because we could just say that's someone else's opinion. Hamane, who is that? Acherim he. It's Acherim's opinion, it's others' opinion. Titania, how do we know? Because it says, Acherim omrim. Right? There's a whole discussion who Acherim are, and they say it's Rabbi Meir. He basically is considered, we attribute his location to the place where the majority of his body is. So we basically end up saying there's a debate between two Tanaim, and Rabbi Hanina takes the approach that you're stuck. You can't go back in. We don't go by the majority of your body. That's a Cherim's approach. But Ika da Amri, there's a different version that Rabbi Hanina specifically says the opposite. The Amar Rabbi Hanina, we're now going to kind of see the sugya in reverse, or mirror image. You can go in. And now they're going to darshan the pasuk the other way. Even though it says, we read it, our tradition tells us that we read it as plural, your legs, which means only if both your legs go out, are you stuck outside the tchum. But if you're only one leg goes out, you're still considered inside the tchum, you can go back in. Then they say, but ha tanya, isn't there a bright that says, lo yikanes, you can't go in. So they say, ah, hu da amar ka'acherim, de tanya, lo makom sherubohu, nizkav, no problem, Rabbi Hanina holds like acherim, remember the first version, he disagreed with acherim. In this version, he agrees with acherim, that we go by where the majority of your body is, just like we do in sukkah. Okay, now going to the next line. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Shtayim Yikanesh, Shalosh Lo Yikanesh. We're eventually going to see three different Tanaitic sources about Rabbi Eliezer that all seem to contradict each other. The Ha Tanya, Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Achat Yikanesh, Shtayim Lo Yikanesh. In our mission, he says two yes, three no. In the other bright, he says one yes, two no. So this is always a matter of how you count, what you mean when you say one, two, three. Lo kasha, hada akar hada vikama tarite. When it says one, it means that you already left one and you're within the second. This is like when you say, right, you're, when you get to the age of 13, right, you're, you're in your 13th year, right? So it's like saying that you're already, right, but, and that's when you're 12 and a day, you're already into your 13th year, right, or something like that. So it's like that. You already, you left one and you're already into the second one. And shayim lo yikanes, right? And then uh, the kamatarte, hada akartarte the kamatlat. When it says two no, what it means is you already passed two and you're already into the third. So what it really means is two. Okay, two is the cutoff in both. They just it's just worded differently. But then they bring a third, which you can't explain in that way. Even one ama you can't. That doesn't make any sense. So they're going to have to explain that is talking about something else. Kitanya hahi modid. It's not. It's talking about someone who's measuring his amot. It's not ulemodid, as it says in the upcoming Mishnah. Lemodid sheamru notnim lo alpayim ama afilu sof midato kale b'ma'ara. If you're in a random spot, and then you know, let's say Shabbat starts and you're in some spot, you basically get two thousand ama from where you are. So now you start counting your 2,000 amma. In that situation, you're going to get 2,000 amma exactly, even if you end in the middle of a cave. doesn't make a difference. Your 2,000 amma ends exactly when you count your 2,000 steps. And then you don't even get amma achat, he says, basically. In that case, that's the case where he says, even amma achat, you're already stuck. Okay, that's a different situation than, let's say, someone who measured 2,000 from outside the city limits then if he went one or two out, he'll be able to come in according to Rabbi Leazar. Last Mishnah for the parak. So someone who gets stuck outside the tchum, you can't even go in. Okay, now here we're talking about someone who's on his way home, trying to get into the city. If you get within the city limits, you're good. You can walk then the whole city. But if you don't make it within the city limits before Shabbat starts, you're stuck. So here he says, how stuck are you? Even one ama outside the city limits, right? The 2,000 ama outside the city, you're stuck. Okay, now there's an assumption here, we're going to see in a minute, that they put up like a, a signs around the city that kind of showed the borders around the city. 
So now Rabbi Shimon says, Afilu Even if you're within 15 cubits of the border, you can go in. When they measure around the city, they're not careful about their measurements because of people who make mistakes. In other words, what does this mean? And now we're going to see in the Gemara for a second. Tana mipne amida. We're worried, right? You give them an inch, they'll take they'll take a foot, right? Basically, they don't want people. They're going to basically what they did is when they measured, they didn't really measure two thousand exactly, or they did measure two thousand exactly, but they put the limit somewhat further in because they didn't want people to mess up a little, right? They didn't want people who were going to, right? If you say, oh, here, people will go, oh, I'm just right over the line. It's okay. So basically, according to Rabbi Shimon, you even have 15 amot, that they went so far as 15 cubits. They put the line specifically, those who measure put the line at least 15 amot further in than it really needs to be in order to prevent people from making a mistake. It's interesting, Sarah, you're saying like Tosefet Shabbat. When I was teaching it just before in the Hebrew, that's what I was saying. That it's just, it's kind of like Tosefet Shabbat, where we add extra minutes to Shabbat or Yom Kippur. We add this extra time because we don't want people to say, oh, you know, they might mess up by a few minutes and then they'll end up not keeping Shabbat. It's definitely one of the reasons they give for Tosefet Shabbat. So, with that, Hajan Alach Mishot Siyuhu, and we're just going to start the next few lines of the, the first lines of the Misha that are on our daf. Um, in the new parak, okay? For this, we have pictures. So I'm going to put the pictures up on the screen. Um, okay, we're in picture number 187 in the book. Ketzad ma'abrin et ha'arim. Ma'abrin from the Lashon of Ibor, Herayon, like pregnancy. But we don't really mean, we mean, how do we make the limit? We want to basically make the limit a little bigger than it actually is. And for that, what do we mean? We're assuming that most of the cities did not have walls around them. If you have a wall, we're going to measure 2,000 from the wall of the city. But assuming it didn't have a wall, there's going to be all sorts of situations, and we're going to describe three right now, where it's not a, a straight line around the city. So the question is, how do you, are you supposed to measure 2,000 amo from every nook and cranny? Or do we basically create, and this is what we're going to learn, we create a square, okay? A real square or a rectangle around the city. So here are the first picture you'll see. Ketam abrin etalim. How do we kind of add a little extra to each city when we measure? You see here we have houses that are going, that lead up to the edge of the town, and then there's some that are further in, they don't actually go up to the line, but if you notice here, they put this yellow dotted line, even though all the houses don't actually reach the line, we make these straight lines around the city, and we measure from that straight line. Pagum nichnas pagum yotzei. So Rashi says, there, there are, let's say there's, there's a wall, but there are these um, migdalim, there are towers that basically jut out from beyond. So here we have a pagum yotze pagum nichnas, some are in, some are further out. So we basically give you from the outer limit. Again, we make this square around. And ayusham gedudiyot vohora sarat vachim. This is something different. This is where we basically say you have, this is already, we're talking outside the city. If you remember, if there's some sort of hut or something 70 and two thirds amo outside the city, we basically only count the tchum from there. Let's say you don't have an actual hut, but you have gedudio. This is a broken down house or something, or some sort of structure that has, as long as the walls are ten tefachim tall, even if you see from the picture, doesn't have a roof, we still count that as a structure, and we only count the 2,000 amma from there, and again, we make a line, a straight line. You see this dotted line here? And from there, right, this kind of parallel to the line of the city, Right, so here you have, it's interesting the way they show it in the picture. You have a house that jutted out further than all the others from the city itself. And then from there, 70 and two thirds ama within that space, there was this structure. We can count from the edge of that structure. That's where we start counting the 2,000 ama. Okay, we'll stop here for today and we'll continue with the Mishnah tomorrow. Have a good day, everybody.